can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand. Let me tell you, oh my friend, about this joy I'm living in. Let me take the mic, go on and testify how I was dead and then I came to life. No more living in the dark of night. No, everything's alright. I've been changed.
Good morning. We're going to start with a song, but before even that, we're just going to read some scripture. How many of you know that when you go to the Psalms, it talks about praising the Lord just all over the place? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. We're ready? Everybody ready? Okay. Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Would you stand and let's sing. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. He's my King of kings. He's my Lord of lords. And I want to praise his name forever.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a beautiful day, isn't it? It's like 80 degrees out today, sunny, no more rain, even though we've got a pond over there. No more rain going on. This is awesome. It's exciting to worship alongside you guys. And if I don't wake you up, I hope that song beforehand did. So, Lily, do you want to come up before I get going too far? Welcome, Lily King. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay, I am extremely excited because we have our Soul Care 2 conference coming up, and it's only a month away or so. So we're asking you, if you have not gotten a brochure yet, there will be some up there in the desk in the foyer. Amen? Yeah. We are looking for a powerful time in the Lord. I mean, we've been so excited this morning, I just kind of had tears in my eyes because I know God has got something planned for us. He has a feast laid in his table for us, laid out. And you know, one thing I want to share is um, the deadline is May 10th. That's not too far away. So register by then. If you don't register by then, you might lose a spot for lunch. And the price is the same, with or without lunch. But we'd love to have you to share a meal with us. Amen. Um, we are featuring, and let me tell you what we're going to do. We have our own Westside Community Church worship team doing our morning session for our women's conference. Yay, come on. <laughs> come on. We're also going to have great fellowship. We will be sharing a meal together. We have three different churches involved in this conference, and we have wonderful pastors, preachers, and so we really encourage you to be here to hear the word of the Lord. We also have a special song by our Deanna, mm -hmm. and we also have a special dance, Bunny and the dance team, and uh, the word of the Lord shared through the various teachers. So we really encourage you to lay this time aside and come and get away just with women. When we get to know each other, you can get to know women from other churches, fellowship with them, sup with them. So we're really excited about this, and we ask that you would, if you've not registered, that you would get a take a brochure, register today. Registrations go to Rosario King and Leah Pearson. Amen? Lord bless. Stay home and watch your kids. Yeah, he's not kidding. It's time to man up. All right, I'm testing you women. It's up there. When's the deadline to register? May 10th. All right. That's how some of you guys got through college, cheating like that up there. But May 10th. With that, yeah, man, it, it's time to man up. Let your ladies get away for a day. Come out and celebrate and worship alongside some other ladies here in the church. With that, too, we have the mulch drive coming up. That's going to take place. Landscaping Day is May 4th. There's a couple ways of going about donating to that. So you can go into your Tidely app. You can mark that down, mulch, in the memo under category 4150. And then that is also, if you don't want to do the Tidely app and you want to go out to the store, you can always just purchase brown mulch as well. With that, we also have prayer in the back. Caleb, wave your hand. Caleb Clant King, everybody. There we go. There's prayer back there. So keep that in mind. If there is anything that you need prayer for, please go to the back. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord God. We just thank you for this beautiful day out, outside today, Lord Father, that we can get outside, breathe some fresh air. Lord God, and just be out there in the elements a little bit. But we just thank you for our, our brothers and sisters here, Lord Father, that are worshiping alongside us. And we just thank you for the freedom to be in a country where we can worship you, Lord God, and just worship who you truly are, Lord Father, and your son, Jesus Christ. We just thank you for this day. We just ask that this message today, Lord Father, would just not fall on deaf ears, Lord God, but it would permeate our hearts. Same thing with our teachers in the back today, Lord God. We just pray, Lord Father, that that message will touch those children because we know that they're the next generation coming up. We just ask all these things in your holy and powerful name. Jesus, amen. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord.
desire is to lift you up, to be exalted in every aspect of our lives, God.
For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Just take every word in. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He didn't form one thing yet. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And the Lord spoke to me because we've had some adoption families in here and we have one setting in tomorrow with Bowden and Ryan and Lexi. And the truth is this, that God has made everyone in his image but that doesn't make us a child of God. There's a difference. He doesn't make mistakes. But he gave his only begotten son so that we too could become sons and daughters. It's a, adoption is a legal term, but it is a right, it is a legal right, and it is engrafted into the family as if they always belong there. Bowden belongs there. It's an assignment. Like all of our kids are assignments. But if you have something in your heart where you're like, man, I, I've heard I'm creating this image, but I don't know if I'm a son or daughter of the Most High God. Don't wait. Right. Yeah. Do not wait. I don't say this often, but do not take your breath for granted. Because you never know when you have your last. But God also has a destiny while you breathe on this earth. He, he, his, his pleasure and will that you are adopted, you are grafted in to sit on Abba Father's lap. That's the invitation. There's room for everybody who's, who surrenders to sit on his lap and look at his face and watch him be a good father. Don't waste the opportunity. Come back with us and pray and receive. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you have been broken. God said, I will make you whole. I will make you whole. I will heal you. I will complete you. But you will walk on this earth and you will put your faith in me for the rest of your days. Father, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise this morning. I pray you speak to the hearts of your people. Speak to those, Lord God, who are on the line, who are on the fence. May your spirit of surrender overcome this place and overcome the people even watching. Those at home complacent. Speak to them, Lord God. Your spirit can be everywhere. Who can hide from your presence, says David. For no matter where I go, you are there. We thank you for your omnipresence, Lord God, but we ask and cry out for your, your presence to be inside of us and long to be with us as sons and daughters because we are predestined for adoption as a child of the Most High God. Will you receive him today? Turn back to him. Receive him. Love him. He loves you. Praise the worthy God. Give him a clap offering this morning. He's worthy. You're the king of all the ages.
can't praise you enough, Lord, we can't praise you enough. We can't stop, we won't stop, we're going to praise you all our days. Lord, we just lift our hearts to you, and we thank you for the availability into your throne room to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you that we can do that as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us to appreciate the family, the spiritual family, Lord God. Help us to appreciate the body of Christ, Lord. Help us to, to gravitate towards to one another and do good to all people, but especially the household of faith, Lord God. Let us be there for one another, Lord, in, in word and in deed, Lord God. Let us build each other up. We thank you that we could do this thing together called life, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for our children. Another generation that you have predestined them. You have assigned them to many things things that we will not carry out, but they will carry out, Lord God, as we all await your return. We thank you for the teachers that are instilling the lessons by the Holy Spirit as interceding and guiding and directing. We thank you that these kids, Lord, although very busy and excited and here and there, Lord, that there's still a heart inside of them to receive a seed that they can even remind us about at dinner time, in the car ride, no matter what it is, that you are planting things in them, building them up for such, a, for such a time as theirs. We thank you for our children, and we release them into their classroom. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you are released. While they are being released, I just want to, those of you who were here last week, how many appreciated the message on forgiveness? 
What a weighty responsibility. <laughs> but God provided, did he not? God provided. And so God has more on dad's heart to share in forgiveness. So we just, let's just extend our hands. Father Amen. God, we thank you, Lord, for just the maturity and, and the depth of study and the desire for your word, Lord God, to thank continue you, to be a vessel, Lord, to teach and equip and build and encourage through your scriptures, through your Holy Spirit. I thank you for what you have put inside of his heart. I thank you that he is here with us, Lord God, to continue to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. Are we ready to worship in the Word? Yes. Every part of what we do is worship if we do it unto the Lord. Yes. And that's the beauty of it. I'm going to continue this week on the power of forgiveness. And so we have the power of forgiveness part two today. And I'll cover a few things that I shared last week. But the importance of forgiveness cannot be understated for us as those who are followers of Jesus Christ. How many followers of Jesus Christ do we have here today? Amen. You know what that means then? That means we have to bear our cross. He said to disciples, to be his disciples, we have to be willing to bear our cross. How do we bear our cross? Jesus is a perfect example of that. Going to face the cross. Going to face death. In the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Three times he says that. But what was his final resolve? Not my will, but yours be done. You see, God's will is vertical. Our will is often horizontal. Every time we submit our will to his will, we bear our cross. And so even talking today, I was thinking about this as a preparing for today. Out of last week, we talked about, it was kind of a double title, the unfathomable or unimaginable power of God. And I came out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where God will do immeasurably more than we could imagine or even ask. Think about that. Isn't that awesome? So he can do the unimaginable in our life. And as we look at that, and, and I was sharing because last week was the week after Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate. We celebrate it every day, amen. But doing that, and, and, and the timing of all that, like I said, because God gave me to speak and start out of John chapter 3, verse 21 through 23, where after Jesus is raised from the dead, he breathes on his disciples. And as I said, that Greek word for breath there or breathe there is not the normal pneuma in the Greek. It's a different word. It's only used once in the New Testament. And we don't find it elsewhere in the scripture except for when we look at the Greek Old Testament, which is the Septuagint. And the beauty of all of that is we find it in the Old Testament where God creates man out of the dust and God's hands are involved in the creation of man where it wasn't in all the rest of creation. He just said, be, exist. And all of creation existed except for mankind. Why? He was going to form us in his image. Now think about that. How many of you want to be the image or reflection of God? Well, how many of you know that God is the ultimate forgiver? How many of you still want to be in the image of God? <laughs> and reflect who he is. So if we're not people of forgiveness, we will not reflect his image. And so after Jesus breathed on them, in other words, in the beginning when he breathed into the nostrils, I call it the first kiss of God to mankind that gave him life. And then after we sinned in the garden, God said, surely you will die. Now, now, certainly they were walking around. Were they dead? Yes, spiritually. Because the Spirit was no longer in them. And throughout the Old Testament, we see the Spirit with them. And we see the Spirit coming upon them. And so Jesus had told them that the Spirit has been with you, but now he will be in you. What a privilege that Holy Spirit dwells in the sight of each one of those who have committed their life to Jesus Christ. What a privilege. 
And then he said this. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Wow, that's a powerful statement. That what he did, he gave us the authority to forgive sin. Not forgive sin of others, of all their sin to go to heaven or, or, or to uh, have eternal life, I should say. But we, as he forgave, we have the ability and the authority and the power to forgive others who have done us wrong. Has anybody here ever been done wrong? God has granted us the authority, the power, and the ability for, to forgive anyone who does us wrong. So I wanted to lay that out. And as I went through that, I began showing that, that, that forgiveness is one of the kingdom keys because uh, when he told uh, uh, Peter he was going to give him the keys to the kingdom, he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Forgiving is all about remitting or loosening. And so keys are for locking and unlocking. And that's why it's so important to see that truth. And we see in the parables when Jesus was talking in, in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, his disciples come to him and, and he just shared with them the parable of the sower. And the sower sowing the weed in four different types of soil. And they're scratching their heads and they, can, they get away with him because they probably didn't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. Said, Jesus, what do you mean by that? And Jesus said to them, for unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. In other words, I'm going to unlock. I'm going to, you have the right to see things and have things revealed to you. They're unlocked to you, but to others, he said, I speak in parables so they can't see. It's locked to them. And so the importance of those keys Today, and what I did was, I put the scriptures down here, because I'm going to be sharing quite a bit of scripture today. That's why I wanted to stay seated, not march all over, uh, so I can read through. I got the scriptures written down here. So I want you to go with me on a little journey here as we look at this, the power of forgiveness. Developing a forgiving heart. Everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not an option to have a forgiving heart. This isn't like going to the car dealership and looking at what options you want on something. And it's not knowledge, because knowledge puffs up. But it's the nature of who he is. You can have knowledge and not have his nature. Now, you cannot have his nature without knowledge. And so we need that. And so today, I'm going to come out of a parable, a key that helps us understand what Jesus was saying, and, and it's out of Matthew chapter 18, the actual scriptures I'll be using, and, and I'll go through these, and so you don't have to worry about writing them down, you can go to our, our, our website, and you can go to our live stream, and go back over this, and write them down. Why? This is so important. Turn to somebody and say, this is important. If we don't master this, we cannot reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Later, I'm going to use a term. I was, I was studying in, in, in Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where he talks about uh, bodily exercise profiteth little. But exercising unto godliness profiteth much. And I was thinking about you know, going to the gym and being physically fit. And the term that came to me that I want to bring in this morning, I'll bring it in a little bit later, stronger, but we need to be forgivenly fit. So that we won't go around singing that somebody done me wrong song anymore. <laughs> but we go around, we're victorious. We're never a victim, we're a victor. And when the enemy lies to us and tells us we're a victim, we're believing something we shouldn't. So in Matthew chapter 18, uh, we'll look at uh, verse 21 to 25, but before we do that, I'm going to give the background, because in Matthew 18, he talks about binding and loosening. And he talks about if somebody sins against you, 
that you're to go to that person. You're not to tell everybody else. You're to go to that person. So that's the background of what he's sharing. And he says, if they don't hear you, take somebody else with you that's mature. And hopefully they'll hear them, hear the witness. But he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And wherever two or three are gathered, there is Jesus in the midst of them. Now, that wasn't about, okay, we're going to have a little churches all over with two or three people and Jesus in the midst of them. He's talking in the context of forgiveness. He's talking in the context of locking and binding. He's talking in the, in, in the context of loosening and binding. So that when you have witnesses to it and you take a witness with you, that in that environment, Jesus is there with you because everything must be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So Peter's listening to this, as Peter is. And he's thinking, he says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, well, Lord, how many times should I forgive a brother who sins against me? Seven. Seven. Now, that was good because the priest usually taught three times. Seven? Jesus says, oh, no, Peter. Not seven. Seven times 70. Now, that's not to be taken literally that after 490 times they've done it wrong to you. You can smack them. <laughs> that's not it. Or you can hold it against them. That's not it at all. What he was trying to say, the revelation of that, is that the spirit of forgiveness knows no boundaries. Does God know any boundaries? When we are unfaithful, what is he? Faithful. Faithful. That's his nature. And we are to reflect that nature. So to prove this point, Jesus begins to unlock a revelation of the kingdom of God He's giving him a key because anytime Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. Hear me. That's a key that unlocks revelation of his kingdom. That's something that you can take to heart. And so Jesus says in verse 23 of of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like. So he's going to reveal something. He's going to unlock. Say unlock to somebody. He's going to unlock a revelation of his kingdom to Peter. Because Peter's mind is, okay, three? Well, no, I'm going to go beyond three. I'm going to do seven. And Jesus said, no, seven times 70. Meaning, it goes on. And so in the scriptures. And that's why I say the the, the importance, the key to the keys, as I shared last week out of Mark chapter 4. He said about the parable of the sword, if you don't understand this one, how will you understand any? I look at Mark chapter 4, verse 11, a uh, uh, version of him sharing the, the parable of the sower and the seed as the key to the key box that unlocks all the rest of the keys. Because Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, and the parables are keys to the kingdom, how will you understand any of them? And so in that parable, he's telling them, you got to get this parable. you got to get this parable. I, it's given unto you to, to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And that parable unlocks all the rest. And so I want to begin reading in the scripture. Out of Matthew chapter 18 and verse 23. I'll start there and go through. Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king. A king. Jesus, what are you trying to say? I mean, is this difficult to understand? Do we have a king? We certainly do, don't we? So think about He's trying to use something You know, in the natural, to explain something that's supernatural, something of a kingdom you can't see. So he talks about the kingdom having to be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought to him who owed him a million dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity or mercy for him, and he released him and forgave him the debt. Now, the debtor was just asking for more time. 
The king didn't give him more time. He forgave the debt, erased it, showed mercy, and said, you don't owe me anything, and you will not be going to prison. That's the king we serve. But the man fell down before his master, like I said, begging him. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. You see the difference? This man owed millions. This man owed him a few thousand. Who owed him a few thousand dollars? He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. What did he, what did he had asked for? And what did the king do for him? He says, be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king went uh, called the man and had, uh, that he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have also forgiven your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king said to the man, sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then this is what he says. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you've refused to forgive brothers and sisters from the heart. From the heart. From the heart. Developing a what kind of heart? A forgiving heart. From the heart. So, you know, there was conversation, and, I, and, and, and over the years, we've, I've had this conversation with different leaders. Well, does that mean that I'm going to hell, or does that mean I'm going to be judged eternally, or what? And, and others, so theologians are, are, are arguing over this. I don't even want to raise that question. Why? Would, why would you even want to know that? Why wouldn't out of love, you just want to do what your king wanted you to do? Why do we ask these questions and get into theological debates, debates when it just comes down to loving him? Then that's not even a question. Because if I'm struggling with it, then I say, Lord, help me. I go to others who will help me. Amen? So debt, the comparison, exceedingly much versus little. Remember the woman who washed his feet with her tears and dried her, his feet with her hair? And he's speaking to Peter again. He says, one owed a lot, one owed a little. Which one do you think will love the most? Or, or forgive the most? The one who loved much. And he said, this woman loved much. This woman loved much. Forgive them how? From what? From your heart. The man didn't ask to have his debt forgiven. Rather, he asked for more time to pay it back. But the king showed mercy. Now, I want you to say, I have you say words and things like that so to help stick with you. Say Mercy. You will not have forgiveness if you do not begin to master mercy. Mercy is having pity, if you will, on somebody. How many know God had a lot of pity on you and I? A lot of mercy. <laughs> we were forgiven this huge debt because the wages of sin is death. This huge debt. And not only for the sin we committed before we gave our heart to him, but we confess it and he still forgives us. Isn't he awesome? All of this debt we are forgiven. And then all of a sudden, we won't forgive someone else. That's not like Jesus. The Bible says that God is rich in mercy and his mercy is great. Other synonyms for mercy, we could say compassion, loving kindness, favor, steadfast love. And so we look at this, a brief biblical definition of mercy, I wrote it down, the gift of God's undeserved kindness and compassion. So this servant, instead of doing like his king did, he did it, or he did it. He did what he wanted to do. And so here's a kingdom lesson. The same will happen to those who don't forgive from what? Thus, the subtitle of the power of forgiveness that I'm sharing today is developing a giving heart. So now, I want to look at this. How do we develop a forgiving heart? And again, 
the term I use coming out of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, that if we exercise ourselves unto godliness, it will profit us much. How much does it profit us? Eternal life. Eternal life. It has eternal value. And what's now, what do you have to do when you go to the gym? What do you normally do when you go to the gym? You work out. What's another word for working out? Exercise. How many love that word? <laughs> if you love it, you can jump up and shout. Thank you, Jesus. It requires discipline, doesn't it? How many of you ever started off the year at the gym or maybe in your house exercising? How long did it last? You see, as well as there are natural disciplines, there are spiritual disciplines. And it's important to understand that. If we want to be forgivingly fit, we're going to have to exercise ourselves unto godliness. There's no other way to be forgivingly fit. So we're going to look at this, the benefits of, of, of forgiving and that. And I'm going to share, let me see if that... Let me turn it on. That might help. Nope, it's not helping. Guys, you're going to have to help me again. Go to the next slide. We had it working earlier. Try now. Try now? Okay, thank you. Hey. So we're going to look at three things here that will help us become forgivingly fit, all right? And the first one has to do, we have to know what forgiveness is so that we can forgive others. How many have heard the word offense? Offense, not offense. And what is that? How many of you have ever been offended? Like, share. How many of you believe you've ever offended anybody? How many were so good at it we can do it without thinking or even knowing it? <laughs> Isn't that the reality? I see Ben Jekyll over there. And nobody wakes up in the morning and says, How can I offend Ben? I'll bet you the people offended don't say, How can I offend Ben? You know, it's just part of our own nature. It's what it is. And, and again, a lot of times we do things out of ignorance. So we must know what forgiveness is. Offense. And so you've heard me say over and over again, and I understand, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, about sometimes people can't because they're hurt so bad they need to be healed before they can handle that. But, but how many of you, you've heard me say it over and over again, I keep saying it because I want us to hear it, hear it, hear it. Offense is a what, Randy? Choice. It's a what? Choice. What does that mean? So who's the choice left up to? Us. Us. So if you've got a boss that just says all kinds of things, gets in your face, but you choose not to allow that to offend you, which means they don't have power over your emotions. Hello? Yeah. Because when you allow somebody to offend you, you are giving them power over your emotions. Amen. We don't have to. What's it called? A what, Randy? A, a, a what? A what? No, I want you to say it again. I just, just have you. Thank you. Thank you. Love my brother. It's a choice. If you can exercise yourself, become forgivingly fit, you can walk in a place where you don't have to be offended. Woe to the one who offends. But you can walk in a place where you don't have to be offended. Now, what's that allow us to do? When, if you get to that place, somebody, your boss can yell at you and everything else, and what you can show in return is love, care, and concern. And what's that? You, you can keep control of the situation. Which we have the authority to do that, right, Jim? We have the authority to do that. God gave us that authority. Why don't we use it? Would the situation be much better if we chose to use it? So I want us to understand what forgiveness is and, and offense, whether it's real or perceived. What do I mean real or perceived? 
Sometimes, and, 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 and Lily teaches on this a lot and works on this a lot with what we call lie-based thinking. How many of you know sometimes you can believe a lie about somebody that's not truth? It's not truth. The only authority the devil has over a believer in Jesus Christ is right between their ears. That's why there can be a perceived offense or an actual offense granted to us. And so forgiveness is all about releasing. It's all about dismissal of sin. But it's not excusing or validating or approving sin behavior. That's not what forgiveness is about. It's extending mercy to others who have wronged us. Is what it's about. Can any of you think of somebody right now that really ticks you off? I saw that hand. You were bold enough to raise that hand. But I'll bet you everyone in here, if not right now, certainly in the past. And you might have opportunity in the future too. I'll just throw that out there. So, knowing what forgiveness is, we can forgive others. Number two, I want to talk about, is this fading in and out? Is it? Do we need another battery or is it okay? Okay, then we're going to go on. Deal with both components of forgiveness. Two components to forgiveness. One is decisional. Make a decision to do it. The other is emotional. The first decisional, you just, you just choose to forgive. You don't have to feel it. Feelings are a great servant but a poor master. That's why he wants us, he tells us to, above all things, I want you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Your soul is your will, your emotions, you know, all of that going on, you know. So he wants us to be healthy. Now, let me say this, and let me see if I got it here. I think I do. I think I brought it. I wonder, yeah, I did. Scientific research on forgiveness. And boy, there's a lot out there. Mayo Clinic. When someone you care, now how many know they're not approaching it through Christ? They're just looking at the science of it. People's lives. When someone you care about hurts you, you can hold on to anger and resentment or embrace forgiveness and move forward. What are the benefits of forgiving someone? I'm just reading from the Mayo Clinic. Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships. Can I get an amen? Amen. Improved mental health, how many want that? Less anxiety, stress, and hostility, how many like that? Fewer symptoms of depression, how many like that one? Lower blood pressure. A stronger immune system. Improved heart health. Improved self-esteem. Mayo Clinic. Well, if they would have read the Bible, they could have learned that years ago. Now, Harvard Health. Goes on to say, practicing forgiveness can have powerful health benefits. Observational studies and even some randomized trials suggest that forgiveness is associated with lower levels of depression, anxiety, and hostility, reduced substance abuse, higher self esteem, and greater life satisfaction. Yet, forgiving people is not always easy. Psychology Today. A body of research demonstrates that forgiving someone promotes mental health. To sum it up, forgiveness is good for your body, your relationships, your place in the world. That's the reason enough to convince virtually anyone to do the work of letting go of anger and working on forgiveness. See, we've got an unfair advantage. We've got Holy Spirit who teaches us, and we've got the Word of God. We should be the ones that are the example and say, well, just look at them. Who were reflecting the image of God. Do that. So the two components of forgiveness, like I said, the first is decisional. It's choosing to do what's right regardless of our feelings. But the second one, emotional, takes many times more time. And we may need to be healed there. So I'm going to talk about the two of them. 
First of all, decisional, choosing to obey the word of God. So I pull out a couple of scriptures here. I want you to listen. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Say just as. Just as God forgave us. So what does forgiveness look like then? All we have to do is look at what he did for us. And that's how. Another scripture, Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances, how many? Whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Say just as. That's our model. We don't need to go to Webster. We don't look, need to look to the definition that mankind gives it. All we need to do is follow our master. Watch what he did. Listen to what he said. How he modeled before us what it was all about. And that's what we do likewise. Now, when we talk about this, the household of faith, I shared a little bit last week because we ended up with the Lord's Prayer, you know, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. But he starts out, our, not my, our what? Father, not CEO, not even great creator. Oh, he's, he is that. But see, the thing is, we've got to see the church, and, 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 and when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about buildings. The literal meaning of ecclesia is the assembling of the called out ones. So when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, we become saints, not sinners anymore. He never refers to us after that point as a sinner, though we sin. He refers to us as a saint. In other words, that word hagion in the Greek literally means set apart. What it means is we've been set apart to serve him. We no longer are held bondage to the enemy and this world. We are free and free indeed. Who Jesus sets free is what? Free indeed. How many of you are free today? Amen. So in doing that, seeing the church as a family. So you've heard me say it over and over again, and I'm even saying it with businesses as we go out. I talk about our family, my wife's uh, influence on our family, being Hispanic, a Latina. Uh, uh, we have a saying in our family, you've heard me say it here many more, and I believe it for the congregation here. La familia es todo. Now, I don't know if I'm saying it good according to how Mexicans would say it, but I'm doing it the best I can. La familia es todo, which means the family is everything. God talks about you and I being a household, not a company business. CEO leadership isn't what he planned on for his gatherings. That's why he set elders, a pastoral team, in every church. And if we just listen to what he says and the wisdom in it, we're better off. La familia es todo. Say la. la. Say familia. familia. Es. es. Todo. todo. La familia. La familia. Es. es. Todo. The family is everything. Now, we have another thing that goes with that in our family. As a family, we may not have it all together. But together, we have it all. That says we've got to master togetherness. Can you hear me? We have to master togetherness. That means forgiveness is very important in mastering togetherness. Turn to somebody and say, we're together in this. Now, that's decisional. We do it because we see the word didn't say this is an option. It was a command, an imperative. And so we do it. We make a choice to do it because it's right before God. And like I've said time and time again, God's love language is obedience. If you love me, you obey my commands. And so it's that. But the emotional, the soul care that we talk about, the condition of the soul. So women, the conference that's coming up, I encourage you. Men, I encourage you be at home, watch your children. Uh, uh, when I was younger, we had that all the time, my favorite meal, because uh, I had to cook, 
and the kids can get his. Son, what did I cook all the time? I wanted to have both soup and meat, so I put a couple of hot dogs and put it in soup. I'm not a chef. But it sustained them until mom got home. It did. So the many times, those of us, Randy, did you ever have to watch your kids? Well, your wife, yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd it go? Remember me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, those of us who are older, we're telling you younger men, support your women, support your wife. We are not biologically confused here at the church. Hello? I am unashamedly saying it. God created us, male and female. I will not go against the word of God for anybody. Amen? How many are in agreement with that? Amen. So looking at this emotional care, soul care, you know, the condition of your soul determines your well-being. And so we want to see everybody healthy, a healthy soul. So your health depends on becoming forgivingly fit. And the medical field, as I shared, just showed that. As a matter of fact, when he talks about love, he said, love keeps no record of wrongs. And we could go on. Prayer, huh? you know, doing these things, prayer, thinking on these things, he says, don't worry about anything. How, how, what do we worry about? Nothing. How many of us struggle with that one? Yeah, be honest. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, let me just say that because you heard me say it many times. There is a peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, hear me. To possess that peace, you must give up the right to understand. Because it passes our understanding. And he goes on to say, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will keep you. So looking at this, and we'll be getting done here fairly soon. I'll call the children back in in a minute here, but I'm going to go through a few more things. Many times we have to address our inner pain. And so we have people who can help counsel you. One of the things my wife does is what's called theophostic counseling. It helps us, you know, connect with trauma and everything in our life. But Jesus is concerned about our heart. He's concerned about our pain. He really is. And so many times the emotional side of forgiveness, even though we made the choice and we do it, we still need to get healthy in the soul. Can I hear an amen? And so the Bible talks about Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, because he has anointed me, the Father has anointed me, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So if you feel emotionally you're unhealthy, don't close yourself off. Come to the leadership. We have people who can counsel, etc., and work with you. Men with men, women with women. We've got, we've got people that will help you. And here, we do not look down our nose at anybody because none of us have been perfected. And we're on a journey together. Every one of us. And so when I come down to the third area here, the spiritual disciplines. Exercise the spiritual disciplines is number three, to grow and strengthen your forgivenly fitness. You've heard me share before, and I really love it. As a matter of fact, I wear one of the bands I wear because these are things that my prayers that have helped me through many, many, many trials. And that is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but you transformed by the renewing your mind, that you might prove what is 
perfect will. And you heard me share again, even where you command the Spirit. You've heard me share many times that that verb is in the past tense voice, which means that I'm commanded to do something, but I can't do it. So how do we handle that from the Greek mindset? As we see both of those verbs as commands and in present tense now, but in passive voice, I can't do it. Active voice is when I'm taking the action. Passive voice is when the action taken upon me. The spiritual disciplines put us in the presence of God where he does all the work. Somebody shout amen. We can't do it. You can't do it. He didn't expect you to do it. And so prayer brings us in to his presence. Study of the word. Not for information, but devotionally. Lord, what are you speaking to me right now through this verse of scripture? Talking to the Lord. You're in the presence Lord, and what he does, he begins to download stuff. Meditation, another very important thing. And then fellowship. 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 The word means communion, common, community, participation, unity. I want to read a scripture. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we, conditional, if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. La familia es todo. La familia es todo. You see, because the end goal of Ephesians 4.16 of us as a pastoral team here and our other leader team is to see everybody fully equipped for the work of the ministry in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13 so that Ephesians chapter 13 can be full. That is the body building itself up in love. The body building itself up in love. If you're not in fellowshipping with the body, how are you going to be built up by love? The body built according to the effectual working of every member. Every one of us are equally important in the body of Christ. So closing thoughts. Bring the kids in. Bring the children in. But when I see the children up here worshiping. And let me tell you, our seniors, our elderly, mature people, <laughs> love seeing our children here Dancing and worshiping the Lord. Amen. And watching them as they look at others and they and you try to raise their hand, they might do a dance, you know, thing or two or flag wave, but because we are to celebrate the life and the victory we have. Right. The banners reflect waving victory as you read the scriptures. Dance. God said he would restore David's tabernacle. We look at Psalmic or Davidic worship. We were to dance with the Lord, play all the instruments, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice in the Lord. To some, forgiveness may seem as a weakness, like I'm giving in, I'm letting them get away with things. This is untrue. That's a lie of the enemy. Vengeance is his, not ours. We forgive much because we've been forgiven much. What is our prayer? Forgive us. In the same way we forgive others. One-sided forgiveness does not bring reconciliation. Mercy and truth must connect for that. I'm not here to go into that this morning. Close as our kids are coming back in with scripture out of James. James chapter 2, I'll read verse 8 and verse 12. If you really keep the royal, the kingdom law found in the scripture, love your neighbors yourself. You know where that first appears in the scripture? Leviticus chapter 19. Try reading the, reading the book of Leviticus. See how well you handle it. It's a toughie. I'll just say that. Love your neighbors yourself. You're doing right. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone 
who has not been merciful. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Mercy. Say mercy. mercy. Say triumphs. triumphs. Say over. over. Judgment. Judgment. And some of you here may need to forgive yourself. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But it means you know God's and the blood of Jesus Christ is more powerful than anything you've ever done wrong. Let's thank Jesus for the clap offering. Amen. Good word, Dad. Praise the Lord. We want to encourage you to worship the Lord. We want to praise the Lord because he has forgiven us, but we also want to praise the Lord because he has given us the ability to forgive others. So we want to encourage you to come up here. Kids, come up. Adults, come up. We just want to dance and, and, and praise the Lord. Uh, Jesus said this. He says, don't just hear these words, but put them into practice. Like wise men who built their house upon the rock. So as we leave here and we praise him, let us be remembered to apply these principles out in the world as we breathe his air. Amen? Amen.
Father, we praise your name, Lord. We speak a blessing, Lord God, over everyone here. Guard our hearts. Protect us, Lord God. May we always be a witness to glorify your holy and precious name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hug somebody. Love somebody. You are released in the name of Jesus Christ.